Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 15 on the course on the psychology of language. <coughs> now the last class which was lecture 14, we were looking at something called discourse which is uh, the way we talk, the way we express ideas. And so the two ways of discourse that we talked about, we talked about something called uh, narratives. Uh, uh, which are uh, one person speaking, others, li uh, others listening to it and conversations where uh, all the people take turn in speaking and, and exchanging ideas. So, what we will do today is we will extend this idea of discourse, we will look at uh, how some uh, basic psychological principles um, as is used as mechanisms for easing out the process of discourse and we will also look at several uh, uh, theories and principles which have been pointed out by people uh, who are psycholinguists and psychologists for uh, making a discourse successful and making of exchange of ideas through a discourse successful. And we will also look at uh, uh, some uh, uh, difficulties in learning in discourse, so uh, some kind of uh, uh, discourse related uh, problems in terms of difficulties of learning. So, that is what we uh, plan to do in this particular lecture, uh, but before do that uh, as we have been doing before, uh, we will go back a little bit in time and look at how did we arrive here and this we keep on doing is because we want to maintain continuity. So, I want to maintain that continuity of how we arrived here. So, we will take a short um, fly back into the first lecture itself and build up the stage uh, of how we arrived at this place or at this lecture. So, uh, the course started uh, by looking at some basic uh, forms of uh, language and so uh, the first thing that we did was we distinguished between what is communication and language and what is the difference between it. And in order to look at the basic form of language, uh, we zeroed in into animal communication system. So, uh, we initially in the, in the first section itself, we focused on to the animal communication system which is the basic form of language. We looked at what a communication system uh, like that should have and uh, why do people, uh, uh, I am sorry not people, why do animals communicate? What are the reasons of communication? Because that would give us some idea of why people communicate for that matter. So, we discussed uh, uh, a little bit about the animal communication system. We looked at the characteristics and the nature of a communication system like that. And from there we picked up several uh, points and evidences and moved on to explaining the simplest form of human language. So, we looked at what is the human language like, the rules, the syntax, the structure, the principles, the nature of a, uh, of a human language system. So, uh, we defined how the phonology uh, builds up the morphology and this morphology then builds up the word, the sentences, discourse and communication as such in, in the language systems of humans. So, uh, once we had uh, understood the basic animal system of communication and the advanced system of uh, language in humans, we move forward into looking into a little bit of the history of uh, the, the language. And uh, we started off by looking at how language evolved and, and what are the uh, basic evidences which are present which give us some hint about the evolution of uh, language. And uh, there we looked at the idea of mother ease, uh, the, the uh, idea of uh, Pidgin, the idea of uh, how uh, language evolved from the proto language which uh, 
our ancestors used to use and what structure they used to use and how the present language is a development of that particular system. We also looked at uh, the theories of continuity and discontinuity uh, from the point of centrality of syntax and that also gave us an idea of how the language would have evolved. Now, there are two views, one is the rapid view of language evolution and the other is a more phasic slow form of evolution of language. So, we discussed that in detail there. And lastly, we looked at some uh, evidences that language evolved from ancestors. So, what kind of uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, exist uh, that language actually came from uh, the proto-humans, uh, our ancestors. And uh, we also looked at ideas of uh, the language gene, how it was uh, disproved and, and uh, this whole uh, branch of things. So, basically we focused on to the history. So, initially we looked at uh, the difference between animal and language systems and then we focused on to the evolution of language systems. Now, once we had some idea of what is human language, how does it look like, what is the nature of it and uh, how it distinguished from animal language and we also discussed a little bit on the history of uh, uh, language, we concentrated more on to looking at how research in language is done because that should give us an idea of what is language and what are those psych psychological principles, what are those psychological factors which affect language. So, uh, we started off by describing the scientific method uh, which is uh, used in language studies, how uh, the idea of inductive deductive reasoning and, and the idea of hypothesis theory building and uh, these kind of facts are used in uh, describing language studies. We then moved into looking at how what kind of designs are used uh, for uh, making uh, language studies, what kind of independent dependent variables and uh, what kind of dependent measures for example, license in accuracy two measures which are used in language studies. So, why should we use and what is the benefit of things like uh, this. We looked at behavioral techniques of um, uh, language uh, uh, studies. For example, the idea about uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, the idea about uh, how responses are measured, how building blocks are uh, made, and uh, we took input from several behavioral studies of how behavioral studies are conducted in language studies. And lastly, we looked at the uh, fact of how language is related to the brain. So, those uh, uh, areas of the brain which specialized in language processing and uh, also uh, those measures which are used for uh, 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 which are used for uh, language studies for example, the fMRI and EEG and how these measures give us some idea on how language studies are done. So, the first two sections itself was kind of introductory which, which led us to understanding what is human language and how it is. Uh, uh, experiments in human language are done. Now, once we had that we ventured into the idea of how speech which is basic form of language which is how language is transferred at least the human language uh, how they are produced and how they are perceived. So, even before going to pers uh, the production of speech we started out by looking at speech uh, perception, how speech is understood. So, there we looked at um, the basics of auditory perception for example, uh, what is uh, the sound wave like, what is uh, the basic frequency and what is the overtones and, and those kinds of things. And we uh, then focused ourselves on to uh, that organ in the human body which actually helps us in perceiving speech which is the human ear. So, we did a detailed analysis of the human ear. Once we had done that, we started looking at the speech stream itself. So, cutting out a, uh, a stream of speech and understanding what does the, sp uh, st uh, the speech stream actually look like in terms of the spectroscope. So, spectroscope is a device which looks at uh, which um, encodes the speech stream and translates into some kind of a dis visual display. So, we looked at those peculiarities of the speech stream for example, the production of the consonants, the, uh, the vowels, how the formens, sorens, uh, these kind of uh, peculiarities in the speech stream exist and how they are periodic, time based. Uh, uh, length based how, how these kind of analysis is done and those peculiarities and similarities and, and uh, various eccentricities of the speech, uh, we, we focused on those kind of things uh, in the third section. Uh, we also uh, 
looked at how the development of speech happens in small children. We looked at the idea of uh, how children learn in right in the time uh, when they are conceived from the time when they are in the womb uh, and we looked at uh, the idea of how baby talk infuses uh, the uh, the uh, those processes or uh, baby talk induces those mechanisms through which the baby is able to perceive uh, human speech. So, <clears throat> what are those factors which help them in doing that? Um, and we looked at several other factors which help uh, the baby um, in, in in perceiving speech and how he develops into an adult and use these mechanisms uh, to perceive uh, human speech. And lastly, we focused on some theories of speech. So, basically we looked at the motor theory of speech which says uh, that motor movements uh, are integrated or are essential for perceiving speech. We also looked at uh, the uh, general auditory framework of speech and lastly we looked at the direct realism uh, which is another theory of speech perception. Once we uh, know how speech is perceived, we moved into something called speech production, how speech is produced and there we uh, dedicated a whole section into the idea of what the vocal tract is and how this vocal tract produces speech. We also looked at various speech areas in the brain, the Wernicke area and the Broca area and what they comprise of and how the dorsal and the ventral stream of speech uh, production really run. We looked at several models of speech production and then we looked at several uh, principles of development of speech in, uh, uh, in, uh, in smaller children. The basic models that we discussed here were the feed forward and feed uh, back model, the auditory suppression during speech model, the dual stream, uh, stream model and of course, the computational model DIVA which explains how speech uh, is produced or the production of speech is explained through it. So, um, the first four lectures um, six lectures, I'm sorry, uh, were in kind of an introductory part where we're looking at how speech is perceived, how speech is um, uh, produced, and the signs of speech, and also uh, the basis of speech. So the first. Uh, six or eight lectures we dedicate into that. Now, once that was done, we started per, uh, understanding that all this perception of speech and production of speech, they amount to uh, basic speech sounds being integrated together to create something called words. Now, the words are the basis of any speech and so we started the next section which was in, in uh, which is the advanced module in this uh, in this course was focusing on what are words and what do they actually mean. So, what you write uh, for example, if you write DOG, what does it mean? So, what it means and what it writes in terms of the letters, they are two different things. So, we started looking at words and we started looking at these aspects of words. So, we started the next lectures on looking at the anatomy of words, how words are written and what do they mean and what kind of symbolism that they have in it and how these interpretations are done. Uh, then uh, we looked at how what are the principles of learning words, how words are learned both in infants and adults. We also looked at how words are stored and what is the way in which they are retrieved. So, several kind of uh, things of how words are learned. For example, we, we looked at the words are learned in a very fast manner uh, in, in a certain age group and then they are not. And uh, we also looked at storing principles of storing of words and principles of uh, how the mental lexicon is arranged, the cortical lexin, uh, lexical arranged, how word has a phonological form and a semantic form and those kind of things which were interest uh, which interested us. Then once we were uh, aware of what are words and how these words actually uh, integrate or help us in producing um, speech or exchanging ideas, the next obvious logical reason was that understanding the sentence. Now, why this is important is one word sentences is something which you do not use. So, words are there, but these, these words are to be arranged in some kind of a logical manner to exchange ideas. One word um, sentences or one word is not something that people use for transferring ideas. So, what they do is they use these words and arrange them in certain forms to actually uh, pass out ideas and that is how the concept of sentence came in. And so, we started looking at next was sentences. So, what is sentences? So, we looked at how the structure of a sentence is, uh, what is the way in which a sentence, uh, the various parts of a sentence, for example, the agent, the patient and um, the verb which can 
contains the age information, the how they are uh, arranged into their thematic roles. We also looked at how these age interpretation patients, how they um, directly relate to the idea of subject and predicate, predicate in a sentence, what is uh, clause, what are phrases and how those, these things actually help us in making sentences. Then the next thing that we looked at is one a sentence, uh, once we know these rules of making sentences, how do we actually comprehend sentences? So, how do we actually listen to sentences and make meaning of it? And then we looked at the down, the garden path sentences and late closer principles, several other principles which actually help us in um, understanding sentences. The next thing that was of obvious concern was how do we produce sentences? So, we looked at those factors which actually help us in producing sentences. For example, the flow of information, uh, the planning of scope and visual attention and all these things how they help us in, in uh, producing sentences. And the last thing that we looked at is how children and adults both learn the syntactic structures of language. So, what they do and what is the anatomy of a conversation. So, once we were uh, aware of sentences or how sentences are made and what kind of uh, things sentences do uh, and, and how sentences are perceived and comprehended and they pass on information from one person to another. The next thing of interest was discourse which is the present thing that we are uh, doing. And so, discourse as I say is more about conversations, it is about uh, talking. Uh, so, discourse can range, range from daily chit chats that we do to high level talks that we sit into in, in uh, various um, uh, conferences that we attend to. So, two forms the narrative form and the conversational form. So, the, the last uh, section probably we are looking at what is a conversation and we looked at the anatomy of a conversation for example, how people take turns. So, that is what we were doing. We looked at the anatomy of a conversation in terms of turn taking, in terms of conversational fillers which explains how conversations are made and why the gap is there. We also looked at the pragmatics, the way <laughs> the discourse contribute to people and how common ground is made. So, this is a chart of how conversation really functions. Then we looked at how conversations progresses and how people know when they should speak in a conversation. So, the differences that I, I told you was in conversation people, most people jump in. So, people jump in and they start conversing. But in narratives, one person speaks. So, first we looked at how conversation works in and how people know that uh, uh, their turn has arrived and that happens in terms of something called the turn constitutional unit and the turn relevance places. And we also looked at this turn transition works in terms of principles of no gap back channels and overlaps. We also look at certain rules of turn taking which is the current speaker selecting the uh, other speaker and several other rules which are out there into conversation. Uh, we also looked at the methods of synchronizing turns between people in a conversation and so we looked at the idea of endogenous oscillators, the idea of entertainment, entrainment and the idea of beat which uh, tells us when to jump in a conversation. We then focused ourselves into something called narratives and we looked at what is narratives on the various forms of it to uh, multi turn units and listener singles engagement. One form of narrative is the storytelling. So, if we focused ourselves into what is storytelling, we looked at what is shop talks, pause talk and so uh, storytelling and what are the various cognitive demands in any stories telling for example, the idea of decontextualization, the idea of executive functions and how they actually looked at uh, how storytelling really works because one of the best forms of uh, narrative is a storytelling. Then we looked at how uh, story grammar is there because story grammar is the grammar just like normal grammar which uh, lets you speak any language. The story also tends to have a grammar. So, we looked at what is uh, the story grammar and the setting, the initiative events and all those forms that we are looking at and various models of explaining that and uh, at the end of it we looked at how uh, these relevance and references actually work in terms of uh, the story grammar. Now, what is of interest to us today is what psychological factors or what psychological principles are used for making the conversation, uh, making a conversation easy. And one of the uh, factors that is used in, um, uh, in, in uh, language for easing out things is something called the use of anaphora or N4. Now, what is N4 or anaphora? <coughs> it is very interesting. Uh, so, uh, what is it? Now, to explain to you what Enfora actually means, Enfora and, and the process of Enfora actually means, let us look at this story. This is a conversation. So, basically the, the 
uh, what I have uh, outlined here is called the repeated name penalty and what is repeated name and penalty? If you are using a sentence and if you are using the same reference every time, if they are using the same form of uh, uh, the same form of the noun every time in the same form, uh, the conversation becomes actually a little bit difficult. And so, for easing it out, we use something called N4, and the process uh, which is which is a substitution word for the actual expression. And then we use something called NF, which is the process of using this N4. Now, in in a moment, I'll make this things uh, clear to you. So, the delay in processing when the same referring expression is used in multiple uh, repeated expressions is actually actually called the repeated name penalty. Now, what I will put you through is that look at this conversation, look at this story. Now, this story says one day a princess was walking along a pond when the princess saw the frog. The frog told the princess that the frog was really a handsome prince. Now, if the princess kissed the frog, the frog uh, said the evil spell would be broken. Now, and if the sentence can go on and on, the story can go on and on. Can you tell me what is difficult here? Now, the difficulty here is the difficulty here is that I am using the same expression again and again using the, pr the princess, the frog, I am using the same thing in the same form. And so, when I do that, it is really difficult. One way to ease this is use a substitute word and that exactly is uh, and for uh, and one easiest way of doing is, is using the pronoun, uh, using a pronoun instead of the same expression. So, uh, its pronouns basically are n for a. And so, what we can do is if you look at the first sentence, we can change this sentence in this way. So, one day a princess uh, was walking by the pond when she saw a, uh, when she saw a frog. Now, instead of the princess, what we have done is we have replaced the word she, which is a pronoun here. And this pronoun now means the princess. So, if we rewrite the sentence as one day a princess was walking along a pond when she saw a frog. Now, look at it, now it is easier to understand. So, this she actually replaces the princess and this process is what is called the N4, the word that is used is called the N4, the process is called N4 and uh, the the expression that she is referring to is called the antecedent. So, and for an antecedents, one day a princess is walking around the uh, pond when she saw a uh, frog. So, she is called the N4, which is the word or phrase that refers back to the previously maintained N course or entity or discourse. The process of substitution that is going on is called the N4, which is the process of N4 referring back to the antecedent. And what is the antecedent? The antecedent is the item or the antecedent is the phrase that this she is referring to and the antecedent is the entity in discourse that is referred back in the N4. So, N4, this N4 they tend to come in various degrees um, and, and we will discuss some of these degrees in the next uh, slide. So, the various degrees that an N4 can come in, uh, we can, uh, what is this actually N4? This N4 is a kind of a mental cue, a uh, mental memory cue for us to know what we are referring to. We, for example, let us say, let us look at this, uh, the, the earlier sentence and we can rewrite the earlier sentence in this manner. So, we can write the frog told the girl that it was really a handsome prince. Now, if you look into this sentence, the girl here is the princess, it is referring to the frog and handsome prince is also referring to the frog. And so, what is happening here is we are using another form of N4I here, which, which here what, uh, which eases our understanding of the sentences. Now, here the girl as an N4 for the prince, uh, the pronoun her should also work. And so, we are using the girl as the, the N4 because it is giving more meaning to us. Now, we avoid repeated name penalty, uh, which, which I said uh, is the use of the same rec reference expression and again and again uh, by using something called category N4. And so, what is category N4? A category N4 is a noun phrase N4. Now, the N4, the, the word which is used to replace uh, the uh, usual expression in, in, in an uh, uh, discourse is comes in several 
forms and one of the uh, form that we use or one of the uh, types of enforce that we use is called the noun phrase enforce that names the category that the antecedent is a member of. So, the uh, one of the forms of uh, using the enforce is called a noun phrase enforce and so what is the noun phrase enforce? The frog told the girl and so the noun phrase enforce is basically it names the category that the antecedent is a member of and so the uh, the uh, the girl is a human being and so that is what it is referring to it is the princess the antecedent is a princess and so the girl is a princess which is a female thing now if you look at the pronoun uh, she it doesn't tell you much but the girl will tell you a lot more about what it is so it is the princess it the pronoun she will only tell you that she is the, the, this is singular and this is the uh, female that i'm talking about but the princess says more to that because it says that is not only a girl that we are talking about it is not only singular it is also the uh, the fact that she is a princess so, it is not just a common girl and so that is what is called the noun phrase antiphor. And the noun phrase antiphors that are more general in meaning are typically easier to process than those which are more specific in meaning. So, uh, general form, form of noun phrase antiphors are easier to process than uh, the complicated form of antiphors. Now, uh, the theories of antiphor resolution generally propose that the more semantic content uh, there is in an antiphor the more mental resources that it will take to resolve. So, the more semantically um, uh, challenging you make an N4, the more time it will take for you to resolve that N4. The more information you feed into an N4, the more uh, semantically enriched you make an N4, the higher time it will take for resolution. Now, the uh, thus the speakers have an incentive to use pronouns as often as possible. And so, the noun for, no, the noun cat, uh, phrase and for is something that most speakers generally do not tend to use because the because it refers to a category and so it has more meaning into it and it has more semantic information into it. And so, it takes a, a, a long time or it takes more time to um, to uh, uh, divulge information or to uh, re-express itself. And so, people generally then what they do is they tend to use something called the pronoun um, as often as possible and listeners assume that non-phrase antiphors where they are expected a pronoun si singular something important such as the introduction of a new entity into a narrative or else a shift into the focus. Now, pronouns which is another form of uh, N4 that we are using is a form of N4 which uh, conveys very limited meaning. So, they convey minimal semantic content. Uh, now, most English pronouns uh, they generally convey nothing more than the gender of the uh, uh, person that the, the gender of the entity that is referring to and then uh, uh, and the number information for example, whether it is singular or plural. Chinese pronouns they give more in, uh, kind of information. Now, another form of N4 which is out there is called the zero form N4 and what is that? It is uh, uh, zero form N4 is the case where no overt N4 is used even though the N4 references can be inferred. Now, if you look into you she learned over and gave the frog a kiss. Now, if you look into it there are uh, uh, two uh, verbs and uh, what uh, what is happening is that the uh, the the main uh, um, n four is missing. So uh, generally, what is happening is in in this case uh, that in this sentence there are two verbs which is learn, uh, which is lean and gave. So if you uh, look into it, you have this as a verb and this as a verb and for this verb there is no subject for example, this verb there is there is an object and uh, there is an object which is giving the case and for this verb there is not and so this verb has something called 0 uh, and 4 or 0 level and 4 or 0 uh, because it, it does not have a subject in itself. So, uh, some languages for example, make more extensive use of uh, this uh, 0 and 4. Now, uh, they, they do not uh, basically name the pronoun. For example, if you are familiar with uh, the uh, idea of Spanish and if I want to say I love you in Spanish, I generally do not uh, people generally do not pronounce the I thing and that is why uh, the, the most uh, people in Spain or in Spanish, they say T amo. Now, T amo gets translated to love you, 
but generally the the idea is that i want to say i love you and so this i goes away and so what happens is the uh, the the verb has no subject to and this is called the zero uh, level and for where I do not have the subject, I do not have uh, or I do not use the subject. And so, when you when you are saying uh, TMO in Spanish actually, actually using a zero uh, format uh, or a zero form and for. So, these are the degrees of and for that can be used and uh, various and foric expressions. So, as I said, you can have a category and for non phrase and for that names the category the antecedent is a member of. So, one day a princess saw a frog in the pond, the frog told the girl that it was really a handsome print girl leading to princess. So, more information as I said, but note that it does not work the other way. One day the girl saw a frog in the pond, the, uh, the frog told the princess that it was really a handsome prince, prince does not read to the frog. Now, unheard pronoun, pronouns without antecedents, they are raising uh, taxes again and nurses to a father, it is a girl. So, uh, basic, basically this is how we were looking at different forms of uh, and fours and how these different forms of uh, and fours are uh, used in discourse for easing out the way a conversation is there. Now, another interesting another aspect of a discourse that guides the speakers uh, in the selection of N4 is basically called the givenness of the antecedent, how much given uh, how much givenness the antecedent has. Now, what is givenness? Uh, the givenness is the uh, uh, refers to the degree to which an antecedent is likely to be within the memory and attention span of the listener. Now, the more recently an antecedent has been used, the more uh, easily it can be uh, remembered from memory and the more the givenness of that particular antecedent is. Right. So, there is a tendency for more recently uh, recently referred to antecedent to be represented by more recent anaphores uh, like a pronoun or zero pronoun, but when the antecedent has not been used in a while. So, basically when you are using pronoun or zero anaphore, it is for more recent anaphores, the, the more uh, the, uh, the, the more expression, the more number of times an expression has been used or the more number of time an antecedent has been used in a sentence, it generally takes up the pronoun or zero level and for, but uh, if an antecedent in a, in a story or in a, in a discourse has not been used too re recently or it has not been used for too long, then uh, it is more likely to be reintroduced with a non present for. So, non, non, uh, the non phrase and for is generally used for those antecedents which have not been used for too long in a conversation. So, uh, Basically, then noun phrase identify determiners for example, a and some and given noun phrase definite determiners the a princess is walking by the pond and when she saw a frog, the frog told the girl. Now, English tends to uh, mark newly introduced entities uh, with indefinite determiners like example, the a, the an and uh, uh, and some while it marks given noun phrases with the determiners thus. So, uh, with the with the if I am using an N4, it is generally the noun phrase and and uh, and for that I am using and with the A and I am generally using the pronoun uh, kind of or zero uh, form N4. Now, the first mention of each entity is marked with A and each time it is mentioned after that it is marked with the. And now, in other words A means something like here is something new while the actually means uh, something like remember the one I mentioned before. So, the when I use the in, in, uh, in, in a pronoun it basically the pronoun means that this particular thing has been referenced before it is not been used referencely, but a and n is kind of uh, something new has been introduced. Now, pronouns in 0 and 4 tend to be used when the antecedent is highly given that is easily accessible with memory. However, uh, in, in talking interactions, we often use an unheard pronoun that is a pronoun without an antecedent at the beginning of a discourse. Now, another reason why we use something called the unheard pronoun is because the antecedent though not mentioned is clearly in everybody's mind. And so, sometimes we tend to use uh, the unheard pronoun as an, an as an and for and at other times we tend to use the uh, 0 or uh, normal pronouns as n fours. Now, uh, how do we make inferences uh, from uh, discourses? Now, discourse is a set of sentence that cohere about one or more related topics. So, when we are discussing what we tend to do is we tend to make many ideas cohere together. Now, to cohere means to stick together and there are two ways in that a discourse can actually use 
cohesion. So, discourse is basically many ideas and so what discourse tends to do is it tends to cohere or uh, to combine ideas together. One way is through cohesion. So, this cohesion of mixing of ideas or cohering of ideas is one is through cohesion which refers to the use of linguistic device to tie together the sentence in a discourse. So, this cohesion that is the first uh, uh, way of putting ideas together or combining ideas together in a discourse and it is the use of linguistic devices to bind sentences in a discourse for example, enforce and conjugations. Most discourses, how do we make inferences of discourse? Most discourses have a random number of ideas and they are coerced together and so one way of this cohesion is explained in, in terms of uh, uh, combination is explained is in terms of cohesion. Now, NFRs play an important role in providing cohesion for discourse by providing retrieval cues for previously maintained identities. And so, what NFRs actually tend to do is when we are using a conversation and this conversation has multiple ideas, these NFRs provides a memory cue to what uh, uh, idea was actually discussed before and uh, this leads, leads to the uh, proper flow of a conversation. The other way through way, the other way through which this cohesion is achieved or this kind of um, coherence is achieved is something called coherence. The other way is through coherence which refers to the use of schemas and logical relations to bind the sentences together of a discourse. And so, what is cohesion? The use of schemas and logical relations to bind sentences of a discourse. Now, unlike cohesion which is overtly marked in the discourse, coherence must be inferred by relying on our understanding of how the world. And so, uh, in this case, the n force will give you an idea of cohesion, but in this case, we have to use our presence of mind about how the world works and that will give us the idea about the, uh, uh, the cohesion uh, that is happening in the discourse. So, must be inferred by relying on understanding of how the world works. For example, the fog said kiss me and I will turn into a handsome prince. Now, the prince carefully considered the preposition that night she had frog legs for supper. Now, obviously, the, the idea would have been that the princess would have kissed the frog and the frog would have turned up into a, a handsome prince and they would have married and lived heavily, ha happily ever after. That is what the story says. But there is an another angle to it which is a much funny anger, uh, angle and what is the much funny angle? What the uh, in real world sense what the princess did was the, in real world magic does not happen. So, she does not believe in magic and so what she did was she never kissed the prince, but rather what she did was they cooked the princess uh, the the frog's leg which supposedly would become the fring and that was in, in a more generic sense she ate the leg as a supper. So, there is a uh, so often times we are left unsaid in what more important ways uh, what is actually said in a discourse. Uh, now, there is a uh, there, there is a process which is called bridging inferences uh, which is used for making inferences in a uh, discourse. Now, what is bridging inferences first of all? Now, bridging inferences is the use of, uh, use of logic or real world expressions to fill up gaps in a discourse. So, once we are doing discourse there are times when there is a uh, the, there exists gaps in discourse the, the, the actual meaning is not coming or there are some kind of uh, 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 non cohesion in a discourse. So, there we tend to use something called bridging inferences and what is these bridging inferences? These are logical real world experiences. Now, bridging inferences Inferences play an important role in production of humor and as I explained one way to understand the sentence that that story that we are looking at is that the princess never uh, kissed the frog and he never turned out into a prince and she ate the frog instead. So, um, making bridging inferences is costly at least as measures of reading time or written text, but, con uh, con uh, but content linked with bridging inferences are also better recalled uh, later on probably due to the fact that they are more deeply processed. And so, sentences which have bridging inferences are recalled better because bridging inferences are actually the logical way in which the world uh, left. So, in the original story uh, if, if you look at how the original story worked and, and how the, the new way that we interpreted the story, the new way of understanding the story which have will, will be remembered more better because that is the most logical way and how something would have been dealt because magic the idea is that magic does not work in real world. So, in real world sense whatever have happened is the frog actually did not want to die and so it was saying something whatever it was saying of course, it is uh, difficult to understand a frog actually speaking a language, but then the most easiest interpretation would have been that the frog was killed and it was eaten and that is what uh, the idea is. So, bridging inferences is the use of logic or real world expression to fill gaps in a discourse. Now, um, uh, Mark reached into the picnic basket the beer was warm and so, 
the, I, the inference is there was beer in the picnic basket. And so, when we make these sentences, when we look at the sentence that Mark reached into the picnic basket and the beer that was he was, he was looking at warm, we of course make these bridging inferences or the inferences that there has to be first of all the beer in the, uh, the, uh, the picnic basket. Now, had there been no beer, then it would have been no, uh, no uh, it would not have been warm. And so, these two sentences are connected by a bridging inferences and the gap here is that there was beer. So, it was never explicitly stated it, uh, that there was beer in the basket. This was never explicitly said, but then we can infer this from it. Now, we also have something called uh, predictive inferences, expectations of what comes next in a discourse based on the sequences of events so far. The frog told the princess kiss me and I will turn into an handsome prince. The inference is the princess will kiss the frog and so that is why it is said and so we use that kind of a thing or that kind of predictive inferences or uh, predictive inferences for inferring things. Now, when we are making bridging inferences, uh, we focus on the logical or the common sense structure of the discourse. This is uh, also the case when we make something called predictive inferences. So, predictive inferences is another way of inferencing ideas from a discourse. In uh, So, uh, what does it really mean? So, we can generate an, ex, uh, an uh, ex expectation of what comes next into a discourse based on the sequence of events. So, as we can generate from it the expectation that the, that the frog will be kissed, if we can generate that from a discourse, this is called predictive inferences. As listeners, we also make inferences and go beyond the discourse. Now, this uh, the idea of bridging inferences and predictive inferences uh, which tells us the meaning of our discourse leads out to the idea of something called the theory of mind. And so, what is the theory of mind? The theory of mind the ability to make inferences about the mental state and intentions of others is actually called the theory of mind. The theory of mind is the ability to make inferences about the mental states and intentions of others and this theory of mind has to be intact in people because if we do not have this theory of mind, if we do not know what other people are thinking or cannot predict what other people are thinking, then discourse would not have been possible. So, we constantly generate explanations or theories of why other people behave the way that we do. Now, when we interact with other people, we assume that they have the mind of their own uh, with perspectives and intentions that may be different from uh, uh, us and so we tend to use the kind of inferences and words uh, in, in a discourse that we do. As a result, we tend not to rely on literal meaning of utterances, but rather uh, on what we believe the speaker would have intended and so that is how we make inferences. So, we know we do not actually read the way the sentence is said or the way the sentence has been expressed. We, we actually all uh, we actually put a lot of uh, idea or we actually put ourselves out there to extracting what the speaker would have actually invent, uh, intended. Now, the theory of mind uh, enables us to distinguish between a joke and a lie. Uh, clinical data shows that patients with damage to the right hemisphere often have difficulty in assessing the mental states of others and so this is how we make inferences from a particular discourse. Now, there are several speech acts which have been proposed. Now, the three philosophers uh, in the 20th century, uh, for example, John Serrell, uh, uh, J. L. Austin and Paul all Greece, they uh, were influential in shifting the common view of language as primary me uh, mechanism for uh, the uh, transmitting of information uh, uh, between people to a new perspective of language as a social activity. So, initially language was thought as a mechanism for transmitting ideas, but these three philosophers what they did was they made a new um, uh, meaning to this language and they what they said is language is basically a social activity and they developed something called the speech act. They said that language is not just mere translating of ideas, what language is more of like a play, it is like an act and in this act there are several participants, they play their role and this, uh, the language expresses in this particular manner. So, they developed the speech act theory which is the position that the value of an utterance, what the utterance actually mean uh, lies not on the literal meaning of its word, rather in the intention of the speaker and the effect it has on the listener. So, basically what is written is not exactly what language really means, it, it means more than that. It depends upon the intention of the speaker and uh, 
and uh, the kind of effect that it is going to have on the listener and all these combined together will actually mean what language is all about. Now, speech act theory it provides a framework for connecting the literal meaning of an utterance uh, with their intended meaning. Now, asked in 1962, they argued that every utterance has three layers of meaning. So, basically what is speech act theory then? The value of an utterance lies, it says that when we speak something, it lies on three facts. It is not just plain words that you are reading, it is more than that. And so, these three words or these three aspects actually explain what the meaning of a, of a discourse actually is. So, it is not literal in meaning. So, what is written is not exactly the meaning of what is written, but rather it is in the interact intention of the speaker. What I want to convey has a lot more to uh, say into uh, what a sentence should actually read and the effect it has on a listener. For example, imagine that a family is dining uh, with a mom, dad and a teenage daughter and a school age son. So, they are all dining and uh, the dad asks the daughter, could you pass me the salt? The teenage daughter replies, yes I could and continue eating. Now, in a perfect sense, this is what um, uh, the, it is a perfect conversation and the perfect meaning of it. So, could the father asked uh, could you pass the uh, uh, salt to the daughter and the daughter says yes you, uh, I could and she continued. Now, the father in the literal sense did not actually mean could you uh, was not measuring the ability of the daughter to pass the salt. What he was meaning is please pass the salt along and uh, can you pass the, not even can you pass the salt along what he was referring is that. Uh, pass the salt along. Now, in the conversation as it proceeds, proceeds, the mom would be very unhappy and she looked unhappy at the daughter at the daughter and the son would in the last pass the salt to the father. So, basically what the father meant by saying that could you pass the salt and the girl replying that I could pass the uh, yes I could, this should be the end of conversation and the literal meanings would have been true, but this the literal meaning is not correct. It is the intention of the speaker, the speaker actually wanted or the father actually wanted the daughter to pass the salt. and he was not actually measuring or not actually referring to the ability of the girl to pass the salt or not. Now, as I said, uh, this, this is called the indirect speech act, utterances whose literal and intended meanings are not the same. Now, speech act theory says that um, any utterance has three layers of meaning any speech has three layers of meaning, the location, the literal meaning of an utterance. So, any utterance has three parts, we have the locution locution which is the literal meaning. The second is called the elocution which is the meaning behind the utterance and the third is called the perlocution which is the listener's perspective. So, the first is the locution which is the literal meaning, the elocution which is the intention of the speaker and per elocution which is the effect it has on a listener. Now, according to uh, for example, look at this uh, <coughs> particular speech th act theory, there are three layers of meaning of questions do you know what time it is. For example, look at this sentence do you know what time it is. Now, if we look at in terms of the speech act theory this sentence literal sentence has three parts. The, now, this sentence was uttered by a mother to her daughter who had arrived home after uh, well after her curfew. Curfew is kind of a uh, time bondage which is given by parents to their uh, sons and daughters of, of uh, certain age to come before uh, to come to their home before a certain time. Now, in terms of location the literal meaning, the literal meaning of this sentence is what is the time. But if you look at in terms of elocution, which is what is the intended meaning, it was the intended meaning is what is the time, that what is the time, that is the way it is spoken and so it actually means that you are late and the what is the prelocation, which is the perceived meaning, the perceived meaning is mom is angry, she is not interested in time, so yes she is not interested in anything else, what she is interested in, how late you have. Come. Now, according to Sarel 1969, when the location and location of an utterance do not match, the result is an indirect speech that we were looking at. The utterances whose literal and intended literal do, meaning do not uh, match. Now, in a simpler term, the indirect speech act is an utterance whose literal and intended meanings are not the same. So, what you mean and what uh, you say are two different things. Although it seems counterproductive to say one thing and mean another, we are often put in a position by social constraints. constraints. Now, as a general rule, indirect requests are considered more polite because instead of asking directly, you give the listener a way out. 
indirect uh, rules or indirect uh, ways of request are more polite because you uh, although you make a request but you also allow the listener a, uh, a face saving time uh, which we will discuss in, in a moment or a way out of the conversation. Now, some indirect requests are more polite the listener may feel more compelled to comply. Now, in recent years social psychologists and psycholinguistics uh, psycholinguists have begun thinking of indirect requests as the face saving devices. I can say something directly, I can say something indirectly and how do I say something indirectly when what I mean, what I say and what I mean are two different things. Now, uh, nowadays people are using this kind of indirect request in terms of the eastern concept of face which is as the personal need to be viewed as a competent and to have one's action uh, impelled by others. Now, the concept of face ties the notion of something called self esteem and respect and although the idea derives itself from East, East, uh, from East Asian philosophy is now considered to be a universal concept. So, basically when we use indirect speech it gives us an idea of uh, saving our face and what is face? The personal need to be viewed as a competent, uh, com com uh, competent and to have one's action unimpeded by, unimpeded by others. Indirect requests as face serving devices give listeners a way out so that uh, they can be more polite. Now, in the family dinner example dad politely use the indirect request which gives daughter a way out by interpreting the utter literances of course. Uh, so, basically uh, the, since the daughter was may have been angry and she, she actually um, interpreted in a second manner. So, the dad said could I uh, could you pass the salt and here the daughter says yes I could and she kept with it and so it was a face saving game or face saving strategy for uh, 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 for the daughter. Now, social norms dictating in uh, uh, dictate interpreting an indirect re uh, request according to uh, the illocutionary not the locutionary force, but uh, daughters flaunts the norm. Now, given the uh, social dynamics in the family the dad may actually have gotten better results with the direct request like pass the salt. Now, since the uh, father used an indirect request could you pass the salt the daughter what she did was she picked up the literal meaning of it and what was the literal meaning? whether you have the ability or not and she replied yes I could, but uh, here the conversation would have been better off by using the, uh, the not the elocutory, but the, locu the locutory meaning which means that if you would have made a direct request saying that pass the salt it would have given better results. Now, Grice 1975 had added to the speech theory uh, by proposing something called the cooperative, cooperative principle which is uh, in a nutshell the proposal that speakers should follow the social norms to tailor their utterances to fit the current need of a conversation. And so, what Grice says is there are some cooperative principles in a conversation and so, if these principles are not followed the conversation would run haywire and so, he gives these, uh, uh, these principles which are there. Uh, what he means by cooperative principle is that any violation of the principle is meaningful that is as listeners uh, we take what the speaker says at face value unless we have reason to su suspect that the locutionary and elocutionary forces of the utterances actually do not match. This triggers the theory of mind process in which we began making inferences about what the speaker really meant. So, what it all means is that there are certain uh, principles, there are certain cooperative principles which have been given by uh, uh, Grice and this should be followed for any conversation to have meaning and uh, to actually pro to uh, uh, progress in a uh, particularly nice sequence. Now, Grice have given something called four maxims uh, which are aspects of speaker utterances that the listener attends to and deciding whether the accept the statement at the face value. Grice uh, worded the maximum in uh, the maxims in terms of what the speaker should strive for and what they are and so there are four maxims which are there. So, Gryson's maximum, Gryson says there is something called the cooperative principle, she, uh, speaker should follow social norms to tailor utterances to fit current need of the conversation. Now, not a description of how conversation actually works, rather the violation of cooperative principle are meaningful, it gives it, it gives us some meaning of where the conversation lack is. And so, uh, the Gryson's maxim, what is it? Aspects of utterances that the listener attends to in deciding whether to accept it at a face value or to make more deeper meaning of it. And the, so, there are four in in uh, <coughs> in total we have the maximum of quality which says then makes your conversation as informative as required uh, don't say too much or too little make stronger statement that you can first 
quality, uh, the quantity, do not say what you believe to be false, say something that you lack adequate ev evidences for. Third, in terms of relation, be relevant, stay on the topic and fourth is of manner which is avoid obscurity in expressions, avoid ambiguity and brief and orderly. Now, speech act theory and the cooperation principles have uh, generated a considerable amount of research uh, for many years which are far more to cover uh, in this particular uh, syllabus of us. Now, we looked at those principles or uh, those factors which can be used in making conversations a better conversation. Now, what we are going to do now is we are looking at some developmental uh, discourse ability in conversational turn taking. So, we looked at turn taking as in, in a conversation people jump in and they decide this turn taking. So, there are some de uh, development of discourse ability in our conversational time taking. Now, before uh, beginnings of turn taking in face to face interactions between infant and caregivers, uh, this decides how this turn taking is actually learn. Now, infants initiate caregivers mimic infant vocalizations and facial expressions and infants attract to adult faces that mimic their uh, current invo uh, emotional state and that is how they actually learn turn taking in conversations. Also something called the, the perturbation paradigm uh, where we have used the experimental procedure disrupts normal uh, infant caregiver interaction observes in infant responses and the other is that infant averts eye gaze becomes agitated or disinterested. So, one uh, way in which we can uh, look at how this the, this turn taking in conversation really works in infants is using this perturbation paradigm. We also use something called the neutral face paradigm in which what happens is the caregiver shifts the neutral face while maintaining eye contact with the, in, uh, the infant and we sometimes tend to use something called the replay paradigm in uh, uh, understanding how these infants and caregiver uh, uh, they learn this turn taking in conversations. So, caregivers infant interaction via video screen first live and then replay so no longer lines up with the infant behavior late talkers. Now, uh, for late talkers what uh, really happens is the process of learning conversation through the facilitation of caregiver is disrupted when the child's experience something called the development language delay. Now, this is a condition marked by slower than normal development of expressive languages uh, during the first few years um, of life even though hearing motor and cognitive functions otherwise are normal. So, uh, in development language delay slower than normal development of expressive language during the first few years happens. Here Hearing motor and cognitive functions otherwise are normal in range and some catch up with the peers, some experience decline in socialization process. Now, late talkers un uh, understand conversation turn taking uh, since that is learned in infancy. <coughs> so, contents of turns considerably reduce, rely on uh, uh, ellipses or sentence fragments, more use of pointing uh, to indicate references and adapt to use of back channels to encourage other uh, to uh, talk so that they have to they have to and so these are some of the problems in talk in late talkers how they uh, get deprived of this turn taking uh, or learning the turn taking caregivers coping strategy late talk takers benefit more from the additional facility to support also high control strategies over stimulate child causing them to withdraw more and so these are some of the um, uh, strategy that uh, the caregivers can actually use with late talkers in developing uh, uh, this conversational uh, conversation uh, turn ins and uh, turn ins. Now, there are uh, when people speak they also use some kind of gestures for example, when I am speaking I am using some kind of hand movements and these are some kind of gestures. We can identify two types of gestures meaningful gestures the first is the called the indexial gesture which is the movement of the upper limb to point to a referent in the conversation. So, when I am moving out and pointing to the camera that I am speaking to this is called the indexial gesture for example, the question what is that uh, is often accompanied by indexial gesture towards uh, the thing that we are referring to. The other kind of gesture that we use is something called the iconic gesture which is the amount uh, which is the movement of the uh, of one or both of the upper limb to imitate an action. For example, the uh, wind flew up, Jack and Jill rolled down. So, this kind of uh, gesture is basically called the iconic gestures. Now, caregivers often use the industrial gesture as they in the, uh, interact with the uh, child. Now, young children seem to be sensitive to discourse cues and appear to use them to uh, learn and associate words with other things they are referring to. Children also learn the use of industrial gestures uh, when they are unsure of a name of an entity.
Iconic gestures seem to be universal phenomena, but it is also shaped by specific languages that it is actually used with. In iconic gestures are used with in conjugation with descriptions of motion events. For example, with spe speakers making hand or uh, finger movements to mimic the manner in path or the action. So, basically indexial gestures, these are movement of upper limb to point out uh, reference in a conversation. Caregivers use these to interact with children as they are naming uh, in a naming game and children use these to point out objects that they do not know the name of. Iconic gestures, these are movement of both the upper limbs and uh, to imitate an action and universal phenomena, but shaped by specific uh, language. We also use something called uh, co-speed gestures. Um, in sentences. So, what are co-speech co gestures? These are hand movement that speakers make when they talk and tend to be lined up uh, at the clause level. Now, an English speaker would uh, likely define Jack and Jill tumble with a single rolling gesture in downward motion, whereas Turkish people uh, would define two separate gestures, one accompanying the downward path for example, like this and the other accompanying the manner of rolling for example, this. So, Jack and Jill went down the hill two ways. So, uh, this is called the co uh, speed gestures. So, hand movement that speakers make when they actually talk and they tend to be line up at the clause level. Motion event are manner plus the path. One clause manner verb plus path uh, preposition in English Jack and Jill ran down the hill one co speed gestures the hand rolling movement. Two clauses uh, this is for English and this is for the Turkish. So, two movement path verb plus manner verb. So, Jack and Jill descended the hill while they were rolling. So, one is descended which is the movement gesture and the rolling which is the rolling gesture that people tend to so. So, learning co uh, speech gestures with motion events both English speaking and Turkish speaker children uh, they use two co speech gestures one for the path and the other for man and adults uh, line up co speech gestures with the clause. Turkey speaking adults one co speech gestures for path clause another for the manner clause in English speaking one co speech gesture that combine the path and the manner information. Also prosody, prosody is uh, the fluctuations in pitch that happens that is we will learn before. So, young children like adults they distinguish happy from sad tone of voice even in foreign languages. So, prosody is also used for uh, making inferences uh, or making how children learn. The way a sentence is said uh, is basically what is the prosody and so uh, prosody also gives you the emotional and syntactic information uh, from a sentence. Now, prosody can be used uh, as a font of sound symbolism. Now, when you uh, when you say for example, try saying this sentence with symbolism a tiny mouse and a great big elephant when you use prosodic cues you will say the a tiny mouse and a great big elephant the way you say this is basically the prosodic inferences uh, and that tells you a lot about the conversation. So, use prosodic cues to face boundaries. So, children learn these prosodic um, uh, cues to learn face boundaries and prosody as sound symbolism for example, high, high speech for small things and low pitch for larger things. A tiny mouse as a tiny mouse and a, and a great big elephant the way I am using this which basically gives an information about the sentences that is used. We also use speaking rate to convey a sense of speed uh, in describing fast or slow actions. Uh, the preschoolers are sensitive to this kind of sound symbolism, prosody and the use of own speech. Now, with this we also use something called lexical bias in uh, in uh, uh, making students understand this uh, speech symbolism. Now, what is lexical bias? Lexical bias in children under the age of line, it is a tendency among children uh, to rely on the literal meaning of an utterance even when the prosody strongly suggests that a non-literal meaning as is there. Example, uh, for example, when, uh, when a speaker says I like it but does so with an unhappy tone the adults will actually mean uh, they will understand that it is. So, if I say I like it or if I say I like it. So, when I say I like it with a more zing into it, it is a positive sense, but I said I like it. I am actually not referring to the likeness, I am referring to the negative connotation of it. So, adults would be able to understand that and lexical bias is that ability where children are not able to understand that I like, although the sentence says I like it, but it is meaning something else that is what it uh, the lexical bias is all about. It is a tendency to disregard prosodic information when referring to speakers intent, rely on literal meaning 
even when the context strongly suggests non literal meaning example speaker saying i like it with an unhappy tone of voice when utterance low pass filtered so that the prosody remains children correctly infer the uh, intent. Now, detecting irony and sarcasm in children under 9 years of age, they have difficulty using prosodic cues and can use situational con uh, con uh, uh, context to use of non literal meaning. Now, Grassi's uh, maximum, the lexical bias exhibited by children does not mean that they take every utterance at the face value. Rather, it seems that children have difficulty interpreting prosody when it conflicts with semantics and uh, con uh, the context. The preschoolers are already adapt. Uh, at using the Grassian's maximum to make inferences about speaker's intention. So, by 33 years of age, children generally understand Grassian's maximum of quantity, generally query what piggy is in the uh, uh, barnyard, specific query piggy is in what in the barnyard. So, uh, by 33 months, they are able to understand this maximum of quantity. Now, there is something called uh, the scalar uh, implication. Now, Grassian's maximum have generated a lot of research on the topic known as scalar, uh, the scalar implicature. What is it? The term refers to a listener's inferences that the speaker's use of a weaker term means that a stronger term is not true. So, the use of weaker, the use of weaker term is actually meaning that the stronger term is not you, uh, true. Research on scalar implicature most commonly examines listener's inferences about the quantity uh, term sum and all, but other weaker strong pairs uh, such as or and have been studied as well. So, listeners inferences that the weaker term means the stronger term is not true. Some elephants have trunks. Now, adults say fall because all elephants have trunk. But logically, if all is true, so is some. So, preschoolers reply true seems to understand scalar implicature and Grassian's maxim override the scalar implicature in adulthood. And so, uh, lastly, we looked at something called the discord impairment. It is the tendency to omit grammatical suffixes and functional uh, words. Now, it is a difficulty to constructing and comprehending narratives. Also, uh, produ uh, produce narratives less content, fewer story grammars, elements, uh, play safe strategies used in, in the specific uh, language impairment children, simple structures and vocabulary error free and below uh, peers ability and difficulty in making bridging inferences and representing story elements. So, choose children which have specific language imp uh, uh, impairment, they tend to suffer from these kind of uh, uh, problems. Also, they have pragmatic language impairment, for example, structural language skills. Uh, is intact in them, difficulties within social and contextual aspects of discourse inferring non-literal meanings and often leads uh, to behavioral problems for example, hyperactivity, aggression and excessive sinus. So, uh, what we did in today's lecture is we moved on from what we had led uh, before when we are discussing what is narratives and what is conversations in the uh, last class. So, we built up to that and we looked at how some, some psychological uh, factors can be used for enhancing con conversations and we looked at the idea of what is n and how this n actually enrich uh, the, our meaning of the discourse, how uh, 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 this n can uh, in, in uh, can help us in making more meaning from discourse. We also looked at how inferences are made from uh, the discourse and what is the meaning of speech acts and how these speech acts are actually helping us in uh, discourse planning and discourse interactions. Then we looked at something called uh, difficulties, uh, the developmental di uh, discourse abilities, how discourse abilities actually develop. We look at how conversational time, time turn taking is developed in infants through the caregiver and how also, how uh, late talkers have these uh, development of this turn taking in conversation happen in late talkers. We also looked at how gestures can be used by caregivers for um, uh, initiating conversations and, con and, and embedding conversation principles into uh, children. We looked at how prosody is used ch by children to uh, understand conversations and uh, conversation uh, related materials and how uh, the aspects of uh, various conversations and how Grassian maxims are used by um, uh, uh, children of certain an age pre going the preschool children and school children how they are using this uh, grassy maxims for enriching their conversation principles. We also looked at several disabilities that uh, the 
the specific language imp impairment people uh, children have and what kind of uh, problems they can suffer from. Now, when we meet next what we are going to discuss is how what is reading and writing and how reading and writing builds up from uh, the, uh, the, the discourse and the words that we have been discussing and how reading and writing uh, they play a role in the psychology of language. But up till uh, that time that we do that it is thank you and goodbye from here.